under the patronage of Lieutenant General Sheikh Saif bin Zayed Al Nahyan, UAE Minister of Interior and Deputy Prime Minister. The General Headquarters of Civil Defense presents the 5th Annual Fire Safety Technology Forum, UAE. Good morning, everybody. It uh, really is a great pleasure for me to be here today. Just to formally introduce myself, I'm David Etheridge, and I'm very proud to be the Vice President-Elect of the Chief Fire Officers Association and also the Chief Fire Officer of Oxfordshire Fire and Rescue Service. Major General, thank you very much for your warm welcome, your opening address, your hospitality, and indeed the opportunity for me to experience your wonderful country. I thought it would be useful to provide you with a little bit more background information around the Chief Fire Officers Association. Uh, we are the professional body for the strategic leaders of the United Kingdom's Fire and Rescue Service. We speak on behalf of all of the Fire and Rescue Services in the UK, and we work with other worldwide organisations who are, like yourself, leaders of the service in terms of fire safety and technology. We work with the government and with the European Union in order to improve legislation to make our buildings and our citizens safer. We drive the national agenda by thinking nationally but delivering locally and we strive to be the professional voice of the Fire and Rescue Service. My presentation for you today is around risk profiling and emergency preparedness. And I will cover various incidents that have occurred within the United Kingdom and an opportunity to inform you of all of the improvements that we've made and the lessons that we have learnt in the United Kingdom. I very much hope that my presentation today will create some questions in your mind, but will give you the confidence in your current approach. You have a very, very good engineered approach here in the UAE. It will confirm our worldwide understanding of risk management. We are leaders of our countries, and we can inform other countries of the best approach to keep the citizens safe keep the country running and keep businesses operational. And I also hope that my presentation today will assist you in your vision to make the United Arab Emirates one of the safest countries in the world and indeed your mission around providing those high standards of engineering and of technical fire safety, rescue and firefighting operations. I think your vision and your mission is truly inspirational and a great example for other people to follow. When it comes to managing risk, it's important for us to understand our risk. And the next few slides will be images of the United Kingdom. And I'd like us to think what people, the citizen, what businesses, people who are not leaders of the service, will see when they first see these slides. What the citizen will see, for people who are not fire professionals like we are, what the citizen will see is a wide-scale flood, flash flooding, caused by heavy rainfall, caused by our drainage system that can't cope. What they'll see is a terrorist attack in London using bombs. What they'll also see is a large petrol and oil storage fire. But of course, as leaders of our sector, as professional leaders, that can encourage other countries to follow our great examples. What we see as professionals are very different things. We see a failure to manage that known risk. We see disruption to the transport systems of our country, our ability to move things from ports to people. That leads to potential reputational damage of our country through the world's media. A potential impact on tourism and business where some people may consider that our countries are now closed for business and closed for tourism. What we see as leaders and incident commanders is a real strategic and operational challenge that we can do something about. 
requiring a multi-agency response, a cross-government response, in order to manage the incident effectively. To avoid having a government that's seen to have failed, to have infrastructure which can't cope with what's going on, and the potential for the world's media, and social media in particular, to provide negative stories. But also, it's our personal professionalism being challenged. But also, it's our moment in time as leaders. It's our opportunity to demonstrate to the world how effective we are at managing incidents and managing risk. So our role around business can be to help business to understand the risks of their business if an incident does occur. So rather than us see here an empty building with the businesses that have no staff to be able to work, they have no computer systems, they have no ability to use their data that they store on their computers. So this building here was as a result of a petroleum vapor explosion in the United Kingdom, which meant that these businesses were out of operation for weeks. So our job is to help business, help inform the business and the commercial world of the best way to keep their businesses going. If we were to take this image, rather than just see a few homes that have been flooded by flash floods, what we actually see here is the need to rehome many families, insurance companies which will struggle to cope with the demand, families having to move to other areas, which means that there's housing needs, there's schooling needs for the young people, and also there's issues around the longer term health of people when they are subjected to disasters such as this. So as leaders of the service, as leaders of our country, other people rely on us to inform them of the best way to manage risk going forward. And we can use local profiling to understand that. People who are on the ground, our commanders in local areas, our management of cities and of regions, to understand that life risk, to understand vulnerable groups, the elderly, people who are disabled, people who can't move for themselves. For us to understand our built environment around our hospitals, around our schools, around our power stations. Also with the hospitals that will contain many people who again cannot move, they will rely on us to help moving them when that emergency occurs. For us to understand the local risk around our transport, our ports, our railways, our airlines, how our airports work, each area will have specific risks within them. And of course the natural environment, us understanding the impact around a disaster on our rivers, on our water systems, on our ability to move water across the uh, country. And the heritage of our countries, the history of our countries. You have an amazing country here, a relatively new country, but the history of the area needs protecting, and our role is to ensure that we can preserve that for many, many generations to come. We also have our communication systems. We know what life is like now without the use of a mobile phone. We also have the role of government around business to keep the country going, to keep the country safe, and to keep the country secure. And that's what people look at us in terms of our leadership going forward. But our role as strategic leaders, as national leaders, is not to necessarily look at that local profile, but to really think nationally. To think about the national infrastructure that the United Arab Emirates is built upon. But when you look at that national infrastructure, to understand what elements of that are really critical for this country to carry on running, for my country to carry on running, so that we can experience those things and provide that leadership throughout the world. That will protect our na national reputation as well as our international reputation as leaders of fire and rescue. Now to help others understand around national infrastructure, it's useful for us to categorize those with the nine areas that you see on the screen. Around our communications, we all know what it's like when we lose our mobile phones. We panic, we worry. It's important that we can understand how the national infrastructure around communications work. 
how our emergency services work together around civil defence, how the energy of the country is made, is stored, is, is distributed, the financial element. Clearly, United Arab Emirates, and particularly Abu Dhabi, a huge financial market now, becoming a world leader in the financial world. So therefore, it's very important that we have an understanding of the national infrastructure around our finances. Our people, the citizen, need food. We need to understand how that food is distributed as part of that national infrastructure and the government's role in securing the country during times of emergencies. The health systems, our transport, rail, sea, air, and finally, the need for us to ensure that water is available. That's the national infrastructure categories, which is helpful if we're explaining through our role as leaders to other people of how these things work. When it comes to the critical national infrastructure, people look at us for our leadership to explain how we can define specific things that are so, so important to the fabric of our countries. Now, traditionally, we've always looked at critical national infrastructure as being a physical thing, being a building, being a power plant, being an airport. But of course, these days, there's also the logical side of things, the communication side, GPS, geographical positioning systems. When you look at all of the systems that support our life every single day. I mentioned earlier on the thoughts that we have when we lose our mobile phones. But can you imagine the feeling within a country if a country loses its ability to communicate between each other, between other countries, and between business and the citizen? Again, the leadership side, people will look at us to try and understand how we can define that critical national infrastructure. Other organizations, government departments, look at us, look at us, our role as leaders, to try and understand how we can sense the criticality around that critical national infrastructure. So it's useful, again, if we provide that leadership by showing that it's around the impact of delivery on the essential services that run the country from the nine categories. The economic impact, if we lost a specific item or a specific area of activity, and of course the impact on human life, the impact on our citizens, the impact on the people who we are here to protect in our own countries, but also to give that learning all over the world. So what happens when it goes wrong? What happens when we have those major emergencies? Well, through our leadership and our understanding of risk, when we see this large-scale oil fire that occurred in the UK, the issue here is not the fire. The issue here for us to be able to explain to the public is that the smoke plume from that fire is going to be affecting three of the major airports in the United Kingdom. The knock-on effect of those airports being shut down is that worldwide air travel has now been affected. Businesses in the local area have been evacuated for over two weeks, but also that petroleum storage contains aviation fuel, which directly feeds the airports of London in the United Kingdom. So a real business continuity challenge. Large-scale flooding, flash floods caused by torrential rain, which I know you've experienced over here, causing a main road of a city to be isolated, to be cut off. But it's much more than that main road, and we need, as leaders, to explain to other people that what we're seeing here actually is a sewerage system, our ability to take waste away, completely taken out. Underground communication networks that have now been flooded, so have had to have been shut down. So we're losing the ability for us to communicate. But what we've also got here is our role as emergency services. We've now lost our ability to use that road to protect the public. So how, if there is an incident, how do we now manage that incident as a command team? Another example of flash flooding and wide-scale flooding in the United Kingdom where a railway line has now been taken out. But the impact on that railway line being taken out is far greater than just the railway line you see there. This railway line in England is the main route for the freight that comes into the ports in the south of our country 
the main freight to go all the way to the north of the country. As a result, the freight now goes on to the roads. As it goes on to the roads, it causes road chaos on also areas where there's flooding. But what we also have on this particular railway line is this is the main line that feeds into London. So now we have commuters in going into the capital city who can't move into their office. We have a power supply station here, which has been affected by water. This power supply feeds hospitals, feeds schools, and feeds homes. We've had to shut this one down. But this electricity supply directly feeds a water treatment works. This is the water treatment works, which has not only now lost power, but also is flooded itself. What problems does that bring us? Straight away, how do we now provide our citizens with fresh drinking water? And for how long? How long can we keep that going for? And what about the people who cannot go to that drinking station to get their fresh water? How clever are we around understanding where our vulnerable people are so that we can take water to them? So how do we start to build around all of this now in preparation for emergency preparedness and resilience so that we can be examples to the world? Well, when I've studied your country, you're now 45 years old. For me, you have a unique opportunity to be an example to the world because you can engineer in so much safety. You can engineer in so much resilience. You need to trust your engineering. You have some amazing solutions that I've seen in my short time in your country. So when you look at your national infrastructure and your critical national infrastructure around your transport, your ports, your airports, but your longer term vision of how you want to use that for the economic prosperity of this country and therefore the prosperity of the citizen. You have some incredible communication networks, some power networks, and some oil. You have some amazing distribution that you, systems that you can use. Your history's heritage, again, going back thousands of years, the need to protect that in terms of tourism, business, and commerce. And not forgetting, of course, the high-rise buildings that you have, not only here in Abu Dhabi, but also in other areas such as Dubai. You have some amazing national infrastructure now and some incredible critical national infrastructure. And one thing that I've been amazed at during my short visit here is your vision of how to put that infrastructure into your country very early so then you can build facilities, housing, business and commerce for the longer term prosperity. And we all have roles as leaders of the service now in order to protect that critical national infrastructure. But of course, as fire engineers, it's very important that we advise. We advise contractors, we advise business around the fire engineering solutions. Intelligent, passive, active fire protection. Such facilities that you see in this wonderful hotel here. Sprinkler systems built in to be able to extinguish a fire quickly. Unique fire engineered designs and solutions. I think some of the engineering designs you have here, some of the architects that you've been working with are absolutely instrumental in the very cutting edge of how to deliver a modern day society with modern buildings. The building materials that we use and the construction methods to make sure that we can build safety in to buildings as they're being constructed with effective fire stopping so that when a fire does occur, it doesn't work its way through the building and is effectively contained. Maximizing the use of modern technology is what I'm seeing here. And I do genuinely believe that you are world leaders in how to approach engineering in modern day buildings. But of course, we can put hard things in buildings, but we rely on people. We rely on managers to manage buildings for us. And that local knowledge by the responding fire crews, employees and residents of buildings who understand what they need to do to stay safe and to evacuate. And I think a classic example of what I'm talking about here is your recent fire involving the Dubai torch. That is a success story. 
you had over 1,700 people evacuated from that building. Not one single injury to a member of public, to a resident, not one single injury to any of the firefighters or the police who responded to that incident. That is an amazing success story, and I think a great example for the rest of the world to have confidence in your engineering. The engineering there worked. The fire was detected quickly. The sprinkler systems put out the fire. The fire stopping and the fire resistance stopped it from spreading to the rest of the building. That is a wonderful example for the rest of the world to look at in how to uniquely engineer buildings to keep the building protected and keep the citizens safe. What we have is the worldwide building blocks that we use for a successful outcome. To understand the buildings, the risk assessment associated with the buildings containing chemicals, containing radiation, containing other very dangerous uh, issues that we have to deal with as fire professionals. For us to have our effective plans which are practiced, trained, luckily we don't have many major disasters. Luckily, we don't have many fires involved buildings. So therefore, it's very effective if, when we do, our staff are completely trained and competent in how to deal with the risk that they're facing. We have the tried and tested business continuity plans. Again, I've used examples as your ports and your airports. What would happen if one of those is taken out to make sure that the people can still arrive into this wonderful country and the knock-on effect to the world is not realized? Information to the public and to business is key. We need to make sure that people know what to do, know what not to do, where to go and for how long. The public information is very, very effective, particularly in the world of social media. Agencies working together to achieve success. If I think and reflect on my career, nearly 30 years now working within fire and rescue. If I think back to how we used to operate 25 years ago in the United Kingdom, we would only share information when the major disaster has occurred. We would only share information when the incident has actually occurred. Now we're much more proactive around that to make sure that by sharing that information, we have the ability to respond more effectively. And also, we're very open and very honest, and that's, again, one thing that I've seen here, is that by being open and honest with an effective debrief system, we can learn from everything that we do to make sure that we can build that in for the next incident to have that continuous journey of success and improvement. Clearly, our role as leaders, strategic leaders of the fire and rescue service and civil defense world, people look at us, they look at us for our leadership, we need to lead our nations around this, and therefore we can be examples to the world. And clearly governments have a role in that. When you look at the government's role in the United Kingdom, it's very much around procuring some of the major assets, buying the fleet, then distributing that across the UK so that we can respond to risk. Equipment, the use of technology, particularly systems that feed us with live time information, real time information to make sure that we have our policies and procedures that are the same across the country, so there can be a seamless service delivery operational approach as we respond to that incident. And of course, making sure that once we've got that fleet, it's maintained in an effective way so that we always know it's available there for use. Now, I mentioned there about using technology for real-time systems. This is a national system that we use now, which is evolving from the Met Office, the Weather Office. They will inform us of the likely rainfall. As a result of the likely rainfall, that information feeds into other organizations and agencies who are responsible for our rivers, who are responsible for our tidal flows coming in from our coastline. So therefore, we can predict coastal flooding. We can predict rainfall, we can predict the water course levels coming up. We can therefore have an earlier response around pushing information out to the public in preparedness for the incident and also the use of early social media. I mentioned the government's role in procuring fleet and equipment. Here you see some of the vehicles that we use for our urban search and rescue for when buildings collapse. 
These are distributed across the UK according to the risk profile of our country and also our response needs. We have the mass decontamination units. These are for when members of the public are covered in a material or we're responding to a wide scale risk involving chemicals, biological agents, radiological agents or nuclear agents. These can be responded right across the UK to help support our hospitals, to stop people from contaminating hospitals by holding them outside, by cleaning them as much as we can, by reducing that risk so that the hospital can deal with the condition of the patient rather than what the patient is carrying on them. We have the high volume pumps. These again distributed all over the UK and these have the ability to pump 7,000 litres of water per minute, not only used to move flood water, but also used to provide the fire ground with water if we realise that we need high quantities of water for such issues, for example, foam firefighting to do with oil fires and distilleries. All of the equipment that you see in front of you on the screen over the last few slides is actually supported in the UK by your main platinum sponsor today, which is Babcox. They have the United Kingdom contract for the maintenance of all of the fleet to make sure that when leaders such as myself need to call upon any resources, we know that it can be used effectively, distributed quickly and make a big difference. And all of that requires controlling. It requires us to, through our National Command and Control Centre in London, so we make sure that we know where those resources are, we know how they're being used, and we know, therefore, how much are available. And my organisation, the Chief Fire Officers Association, is instrumental in supporting the government around the procurement and the delivery of these assets to make sure that we can think nationally but we deliver locally and make a difference to the citizen. And of course at the end of the day it's all about this, it's all about working together to gather that information so that we know what the risks are that we're dealing with and we can put our plans into place. It's about assessing that threat and the risk, that critical national infrastructure providing that criticality scale so we as leaders can inform others, other government departments, other businesses, other countries of the best way to manage that risk going forward. For us to consider the powers that we need in terms of legislation to advise governments on the legislation that they need to bring into place to help promote the country, help promote business, help promote economic prosperity. We have options around contingencies. Different organisations deliver different elements. There's issues that fire will deliver, will civil defence deliver, will the military deliver. And it's about us working together in a multi-agency way to resolve that incident. And through that path of continuous improvement, through a debrief system, we can understand and make sure that the next time we respond will be much more effective and much more professional than we've been before. So as professional leaders, as sector competent leaders of our countries, people look to us to make sure that we can implement lessons learned going forward. And that to me is the most open and transparent style of leadership that the country expects. So does it work? This is the water pumping station that I showed you earlier on, which had to be shut down, no power supply, couldn't treat the water to provide drinking water to the public. And here it is protected, ready for the next tidal surge that comes in and the flood water to make sure we can keep that water flowing throughout the UK. Here we have the electrical substation, which was inundated with water, shut down. The effect of that was a knock-on impact to things like hospitals, schools, government buildings and business. And here is the same setup now, protected, bunded, pumps in operation, ready for the water to come into action. Because of course, you're in a unique position, you're still building your infrastructure. We are dealing with infrastructure that's been there for many years. So by you building your infrastructure now, you can build it in such a way where you can engineer such measures to make sure that they remain protected going forward. Some of the national machinery that I described earlier on, which the government procure for us, distribute over the UK and that we deal with. This is that equipment in action at various incidents all over the UK, overseen by Fire and Rescue on behalf of the United Kingdom Government. 
And ultimately, what we're talking about here is a real team approach, recognising that we all have roles, both within fire, within the police, calling upon the military to assist, a multi-agency approach across our countries to make sure that we can deliver on behalf of our citizens. And this photograph here is taken at our National Fire Service Training College at Morton in the Marsh. Now, ultimately, for us, it's around leadership. Our staff look to us for leadership. Our governments look at us for leadership. Our nation expects leadership from us. Uh, leadership which is then shown all over the world. And one thing that I was particularly proud of, of an incident that I attended many years ago, was when my Prime Minister, the Right Honourable David Cameron, came to the wide-scale flooding, came to see our role around helping the citizen looking at all of the equipment, all of the incident command that was now in place in order for us to be able to respond to make sure that the image that went back, not only to the world, but also to our communities, is of agencies that are managing the emergency that we're dealing with. And it was a great honour for me to have that leadership shown by our Prime Minister when he came and had a conversation with me and met many of the teams who I was commanding at that particular time. And indeed, before I came over here last week, I had a conversation with government around my arrival here in the United Emirates. And I was asked to send the best wishes of the government to you all and wish you the very best of luck with this conference. I very much hope that the presentation that I've just given you here is the start of a relationship not only between myself as a fellow fire professional and leader, but also the Chief Fire Officers Association and the Ministry of Civil Protection here within and Civil Defence here within the United Arab Emirates. We strive to work together with associations all over the world to make sure that we can create a safer society, to create a more prosperous business, to help encourage countries to develop right across the world. And I think the United Kingdom, coupled with the United Arab Emirates, we have so much to be able to offer so many people all over the world in terms of true inspirational leadership around managing risk, managing resilience, and responding to emergency incidents. So finally, I really do respect that your time is very precious. Thank you once again, particularly to the Major General, for your invitation here today and for my opportunity to present to you as a conference. I wish you all the very best, not only for this conference, but also for your future. And thank you very much for listening to me.